This is a 1985 Daihatsu Rugger. Uh, here in the United States, we got something extremely similar to this called the Daihatsu Rocky, uh, because Daihatsu only sold two cars in the United States market, uh, the Charade being the other one, and then the Rocky. Uh, the Rocky in the United States is pretty much the same thing as this. Um, this is older, of course. We didn't get this front grill styled round headlight version. Uh, but the Rocky is the same thing as this, and a lot of people looking at this kind of assume it's a Rocky, but only sort of. Uh, you'll notice in front of the rear wheels how there's that extra length here, because this is the long wheelbase version. Um, it just means it's a little longer. Uh, it's, it's still got two doors, probably has a little bit more room in the back. I've never been in an actual uh, US domestic Rocky. Um, this is turbo diesel, as it says. It's a 2.8 liter. Uh, four-cylinder straight, four-cylinder turbo, non-intercooled diesel engine. It's a Daihatsu engine. Uh, these were sold also, uh, in Japan at least, as the Toyota Blizzard. They're identical, uh, except the Toyota Blizzards come with a 2.4 liter Toyota diesel engine, uh, turboed, whereas all the Daihatsus come with a 2.8 liter Daihatsu engine. Uh, I believe the gasoline engines in the Rockies and Ruggers and Variants of this uh, are Toyota engines, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, elsewhere in the world, uh, this model was sold as the 4-track in the United Kingdom. Uh, it's still fairly popular there, uh, like on farms and things, at least from what I've seen and got out of it, is that these are extremely reliable and everybody loved them, it's just they rust. Um, they're popular in Indonesia, where I believe they're still called the Taft. Um, but they have a lively aftermarket support thing for this. Um, and in fact, I got a lot of these parts from Indonesia and the UK to get mine where I'd like it to be. Uh, and then elsewhere in Europe, this long wheelbase diesel powered version was called the Rocky. So there's multiple markets where it's called the Rocky, but again, the United States had to be the weird one out because we didn't get the diesel. Um, that's pretty much it for like sort of history. Um, they made this version up until like 1996 or 1999, something like that, uh, where they all had the 2.8 liter. Later they were intercooled, not long after this. Uh, they would add fender flares out, uh, plastic ones that just stick to it. Uh, the grill, they got square headlights. Otherwise really similar, and if you're familiar with the Daihatsu Rocky, uh, once we start poking around and looking at it, you'll be like, oh yeah, that's totally it. So anyway, uh, like I said, this is a 1985 Daihatsu Rugger, a Rugger being the Japanese market name for this vehicle. Um, this one, when I got it, uh, was a one-owner car. I have all the original paperwork, manuals, uh, maintenance history booklets, all that sort of stuff. Um, and it was well taken care of. This one does have air conditioning and it works and it functions, which is great. Um, must have been a fairly rare option at the time, or at least Daihatsu was proud of it. Because in the manual, you get your manual and you get your service book and you get that sort of stuff, but then you get this big blue fold-out poster that's all about the air conditioning and how to use it and how it works and all that sort of stuff. It's in all in Japanese, so I can't just read it. I have to stick a Google app on it to understand what it says, but that's what it says. Uh, being from Japan, it's right-hand drive. This one is equipped with a five-speed manual transmission, um, and it's got a low-range gearbox. Uh, locking hubs up front, front differential. Uh, these are the original wheels. The top here um, technically can come off. This is just bolted. However, with the long wheelbase versions, this door it's one solid piece, so you'd have to do something with the door, otherwise you'd have this panel of glass sticking up. I haven't done it yet, but I probably will, because why not? Uh, the paint's all original. It, uh, it's worn. You can kind of see marks and things on it, uh, just scratches and wear bits to it. Uh, I don't think it was ever washed, either, um, and the person who owned it before was a smoker as well, but they cared about it. The, I have to imagine from new, it was undercoated, and I think it was undercoated at least twice. Uh, so there isn't any rust on it. Like, truly is it. 
the most rest I found was when I was refinishing these wheels. They were spray painted black and just kind of in rough shape. Uh, the tires that this came with had inner tubes in them, like big, you know, inner tubes in the tires. And I didn't know that until I started taking them all apart. And because of that, the valve stem wasn't sealed. So all the way around here was really rusty on the inside. And so I had to sandblast them, refinish them. And then a friend of mine welded material back to give the valve stems a place to seal. Uh, but it's all good now. Uh, other things, when I got it, the suspension, the front two sprint leafs were collapsed. It's got four uh, leaf springs all the way around. The fronts were collapsed. The rear right was frozen in the shackle. So you have the leaf spring, the shackle, and the shackle it's supposed to move like this. This part was frozen on the inside, so it didn't move anymore. Um, so I had to get new suspension. The only way to get that off was to cut it off. Um, but I ordered four new leaf springs, and the absorbers were all shot too. And uh, I had to get those from the United Kingdom. I went to, people in the UK will be more familiar with this, but those of you in the United States, we, we don't have these. Um, and getting parts for Dahatsu's is, well, you're going to be importing anything anyway. So my adventure with replacing the suspension started with me realizing that I was going to have to go through the UK. Could have went through Indonesia, but they're further away and they don't speak English. So the UK just makes it easy being an American. Um, I contacted Milner off-road first. They were extremely helpful, but they couldn't ship to the United States, and I'm in Florida, so. But that was nice that they were as helpful as they were, considering they couldn't make any money off me. Um, and then I contacted both KS International and Japanese 4x4 spares. KS International decided for me that it wasn't worth it and that I wouldn't be willing to pay shipping costs, because shipping leaf springs across the ocean isn't going to be cheap. Uh, unfortunately for them, I knew exactly what I was doing, and I was willing to pay for that, and I was offended that they decided that it wasn't going to be worth it. So if that matters to you, uh, I can't recommend KS International because, well, if you're in the United States, they just won't even bother. Uh, however, a Japanese 4x4 spares, a gentleman by the name of Rob there, was extremely helpful, uh, was willing to ship to the United States, and because of that, I ended up buying more parts than I was after. Uh, I got like a filter kit, um, front rotors or discs that they kept calling them, and pads and things. And it was just a really pleasant experience. And while it's true, I did spend almost as much as shipping as I did on the parts. It didn't matter. What, I have no alternative. So it has four new leaves all the way around, uh, poly bushings and shackles and all that sort of stuff. It has, uh, I got new bushings for the Panard rod, um, new absorbers all the way around, they're Monroe Adventures. Um, got new tires on it, refinished the wheels. Uh, I ordered Daihatsu key blanks from Indonesia, actually. So that's nice. These center caps, they didn't come with it. Um, and they're somewhat hard to find, so I also ordered these from Indonesia. Specifically, there's a, I think, Ted's 4x4 in Jakarta. Uh, he helped me out, which is really great. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much all I've done to it. Uh, changed the oil, but other than that, it hasn't needed anything. <clears throat> uh, for those of you that do look at auctions, this was a grade 4 with a grade C interior. Um, and the issues were the power steering pump, or the steering made a squeal, the belt was squealing when you turn the wheel. Turns out the power steering pump was just pushed over a little bit, so you just loosen it up and push it back, so that's gone. Uh, and then the suspension was frozen, um, but other than that, even the AC worked. Um, doesn't have any leaks. Like I said earlier, it doesn't have any rust. Um, the biggest complaint I guess I have about it is the previous owner never washed it. Uh, this is dirty now. It's, I daily drive this. so. But they never washed it. So the glass itself was heavily, like you can kind of see it right here. And I didn't get it all the way. Maybe you can see it in here. But it was like a shower door with somebody that has hard water that never, ever washed it. So I had to do some pretty heavy scrubbing in order to get the windows clean, and all of them. 
uh, the paint itself also had a texture on it. So you just get a clay bar and you just do a few swipes and you turn it around and look at it. It's pink, which leads me to believe that whoever owned this parked it pretty consistently next to some sort of sprinkler system because there's no other way that you would get like an even mist of what I assume is rust. Like I said, it was pink. Anyway, besides that, this is a DX model and I don't know enough about the model grades to know what that means. However, this does have air conditioning, which was an option. Uh, it does have these headlight washers, factory fog lights, and I don't know whether uh, I don't know what other options there were for it. Um, however, those seem to be fairly luxurious for somebody buying a little diesel off-roader in 1984, or sorry, 1985. Um, well, what else? I think it's pretty much for the exterior. Um, evidence that it was really taken care of, well, it's all in one piece. It doesn't have any rust on it. It does have this sort of stuff, which is where the paint is just kind of thin. Um, and it's just on the door too, so like, there's nothing in here. None of the joints and all that sort of stuff, but right here, this is stuff I have to take care of. This is where the door meets up against the seal here. So when it rains, you can see it. That's just where the water sits. So I'm guessing that, and there's some more down here in the same sort of pattern. Uh, but the panels themselves are good. It's just gotta be something with the door and the paint because it's a separate piece. Um, exterior wise, I'm missing right here. You can kind of see it, but it's supposed to say Rugger DX. It's just a label that was stuck there. Don't know what this says. This is supposed to say Daihatsu, um, and it still kind of does, but it's faded because it's well, ancient now. Cool little diesel turbo sticker over here. And uh, if you're watching this and you're not in the United States, we didn't get any diesels and turbo diesels. So when you drive something like this, especially like an off-roader trucky type thing, uh, it gets a lot of attention just because it's a turbo diesel. Diesel's kind of fetishized here because we never got it. So it's like grass is always greener on the other side sort of thing. Um, anyway, continuing, we've got factory fog lights, which work just fine. Uh, there's a switch that you flip, and then when you turn the headlights on, it'll come on. Turbo logo, signifying it's a turbo diesel. These did come in non-turbo forms. Um, this one seems plenty quick to me. I don't know what those are like without the turbo, but I'm glad I got it, because, well, it's a turbo, and you get a cool little red thing. Rugger logo, and I'm pretty sure this red stripe here and the R is supposed to be the same as here, but years have faded it, so I'll probably refinish that at some point. Japan requires a front plate. Uh, here in Florida, we do not, so this is just empty, which is nice that they just have a place to stick it as opposed to, I've got a Toyota Crown wagon and it has this huge like stage to put a front plate on, which is useless to me because, well, I don't need one. The lenses and everything are good. Uh, another part about this being well-loved is this front bumper thing here, this little plastic cap on the end doesn't have any gouges on it. And same thing with the mirrors. And like usually these are just, well, they hit things, you know? So again, whoever owned this really loved it, uh, just didn't wash it. Uh, I guess that's really it for the exterior. I mean, I've walked around it a few times. And this is just what it is. So we'll look at the inside. Let's, I might as well start with the driver's side. Ah, uh, here's your door card. No idea, no idea how to use the like uh, low range gearbox and everything. And this is talking about the seats, which I'll demonstrate over on the passenger side because I don't want to change where the seat are because where, <laughs> where I have the seat at, because there's no memory system. Uh, so these are seats. It's all original. Um, it's in really good shape, especially for being as old as it is and being a smoker's car because it smelled like an ashtray when I first got it. Um, it does have a tear right here, 
which is kind of a bummer, but well, it's amazing that it's in as good a shape as it is. Uh, it's not sunk at all. It's just kind of, well, you can see when you slide in just this for 30 plus years and see where that gets you. Um, the back seat is in good shape as well. Um, and it's not too terrible to sit back there, but we'll talk about that. Ah. So yeah, this is five speed manual. Mentioned that already and it's the standard pattern. So first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and then reverses down and to your right. Um, if you've never driven a right hand car, everything's the same. So uh, you can see these, but the pedal, clutch, brake, gas. If it's not automatic, it'd be brake and gas. So the pattern, shift pattern is the same. Pedal layout is the same. The only thing that is different is the turn signal stock. It's flipped. Some cars are like this anyway, uh, to where they have this turn signal on the right hand side over here. I've heard of it, I don't know. Uh, but this is the biggest thing I've ever had to deal with with switching from left to right hand drive cars is I'll flip on the wipers when I'm trying to signal that I'm turning. Um, all right, anyway, back to specifically this. Um, it's in good shape in here. It's Spartan, but, well, it's not ostentatious. It's not, it's just as much as you need. Like a, you know, like an original Jeep or something. Uh, the steering wheel does have tilt. It does have telescoping. Um, warning lights here, fuel drain, oil, charge. I'm not exactly sure what the fuel drain is. Oil, obviously, is oil pressure. Charge. Temperature, it's a real temperature gauge, so, you know, it fluctuates. Uh, it runs cool. There's no problem with the cooling system at all. In kilometers, this one has 104,161 kilometers. It's rolled over once. Um, I average about 25 miles to the gallon. That's U.S. gallons, and for driving around the city, which is phenomenal. Uh, RPM gauge. It's got a pretty flat torque curve, although pretty much up into the two and 2500 is where the turbo kicks on. A lot of power comes from. When the turbo kicks on, uh, there's a little square above the turbo here that lights up green which is really awesome when it's at night and there's this little light thing is blinking and you instantly go, oh, what's wrong? Oh, what's wrong? Because it's the only thing that changes, like consistently. Uh, glow plugs, brake light that lights up if your emergency brake is on, which I always use. Fuel gauge works just fine. Uh, this is the rear window defroster, which is the lines back there. Huh. Your mirror's all messed up. This is the fog lights. Um, so they won't turn on if the switch is on. You have to actually flip the light on, at least to the fog light system, and then it'll turn on. The rear wiper, flip it on. The wiper will just go. You press it and it'll actually spray. Wiper is the same. You guys know how this works. Intermediate, low, high, you pull. Uh, this also controls the headlights. So if you pull this, the headlights will also get sprayed. Maybe if they're on, I'm not, I don't remember and I've never actually looked at it. Regardless, this is how you control the headlight switch and the, or headlight sprayer and also the windshield sprayer. It's just this, pulling this one switch. Uh, air conditioning down here, if you can see it, but it's just this knob over here and that turns it on as long as you have it to cool. Um, and then they suggest keeping it in recirculation. And it works great, actually. Uh, clock that is just a green uh, LCD, and it works just fine. Uh, it's only on when the car is on, though. And this is a, uh, I should know what this is, but it's one of those balls that tells you the angle of approach and where you're at and like degrees and all that sort of stuff. And it works just fine. You can see it move. Uh, voltmeter, which is nice. So it actually gives you a readout of what your alternator is doing and how your battery is and all that sort of stuff cup holder that came with it uh there's no cup holders in here so just left it it clamps on this little rubberized bar right here uh, again it was a smoker's car uh, i'm not a smoker so receipts and straw wrappers and things make their way in there uh this is the smoke damage cigarette burns only down here there isn't any on the seats there isn't any on like the dashboard or the door cards or anything which is nice you can see how used that is 
Uh, the heat works really well also, but again, I'm in Florida, so I don't need the heat as much as a lot of people might. Uh, it did have a terribly ugly stereo system that was sitting in here. And as you can see, it's a, well, it's a fucking mess. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't done anything like this because I've been working on the mechanics, mechanicals and like the suspension and everything to get it completely road ready. And then I'll be doing something with this. Um, it just has two front speakers attached to this were these two like loose boxes that just sat back here. It was terrible looking. Um, so I just took them out. Uh, up here, have this little pop-out like air vent roof thing. There probably is a way to fully remove it, but it isn't something that it's meant to do. Kind of like the rear here, this could come off, but it's not really meant for it. Same thing with this one. Um, that's pretty much it for the interior on the driver's side. Let's go to the passenger side. Uh, same thing with the seat. This one's in nicer shape than the driver's side, simply because it was used less. So there isn't so much uh, creasing here. Although you can still see where it does it when people get in. I just try to make it a habit of lifting my ass up and dropping it in the seat. Again, door cart's in good shape and the windows are in good shape too. Just have it down because it's fairly warm. Thanks for that bird shit. Passenger gets a bit more room because the differential intrudes into the driver's side footwell. It's not anything you actually notice when you're driving it, but if you're just sitting here in silence, like sticking your feet in the footwell, you'll notice, but it's minor. Um, pretty much the same thing. Hey, there's nothing, nothing else about it. Uh, this didn't come with it. That's ours. Glove box. Uh, I didn't talk about this. So, this also had the three-stage dampener option, which means when you're driving around and you're like doing some serious off-roading, you turn to soft and the absorbers are much softer, so the wheels will, you know, have more travel in them, or at least easier travel. There's a medium mode, which is in between soft and hard, and then hard mode, which according to the manual is what you use when you're driving on-road. Because I replaced the absorbers, uh, these no longer do anything. But how it works is you have the original absorber, and then you have the part up the top that you normally just stick in uh, some bushings with the metal bolt just to hold it in like the, the frame. Uh, but instead, there's this little electronic box that sits on top, and the top part of the absorber is exposed, and it's got this little valve thing that sticks in it. So when you flip this switch, and this is on all four wheels, it electronically spins the little metal thing, which changes like this little venturi thing, and it determines how much fluid gets pushed in between. So if you flip it to soft, it would spin more and allow more fluid to travel, something like that. Anyway, it's kind of a neat solution to, well, a problem I don't have, um, but trying to get replacement absorbers of these one cost as much as all four of the minerals I bought So and I'm not gonna do any serious off-roading, so it's fine uh, Yeah, that's that sit in the back seat. Oh and uh, To talk about this here, it's kind of faded, but What they're talking about there is down here this isn't a normally mounted seat. This is a little joint thing. So, you want to get in the back, slides forward, and that's as far as it goes. Oh no, I need more space. Wow. And then you can sit back here. And pull it back. Because that sticker reminds you to not drive around with a seat lopped forward it's supposed to be back so this is the rear uh this ashtray was filled with cigarettes when i got it uh you get decent room i'm 5'10 and it's not terribly comfortable back here this seat's all the way back too so there but it'd be all right uh this can't be adjusted at all so it's just a straight back thing the 
points of attachment are right here. So, you know, whatever. There's no seat belts back here either. Um, so I do have some a poor, <laughs> excuse me, poor replacements for it that are just, uh, what the hell, carabiners. Real ones, not like keychain ones. Back here, that just attach at the tie downs. And then I have this seatbelt. For somebody that wants to at least stay in it, if for some reason I hit the brakes real hard. Uh, this is the back bed. So this does fold forward. So you get a decent amount of space. Um, under here, the metal's all in good shape. No rust, no rot. And these long ago ripped out of the fabric, but these are supposed to be, you know, laid in. Um, came with the original Daihatsu tool kit, which is cool. They're just cheap tools, but they have the Daihatsu stamp on them, so that's nice. This is my first aid kit. I added, cause you know, you never know. The rear door card back here. Uh, this is the filler for the rear washer fluid. It's like this bag that sits back here. But it does work. Um, that's, that's that for that, I guess. Uh, when I got this, a lot of things were dry. So like this was just dry rust and it was just scraping. So I spent a long time going through and using like a bunch of synthetic grease and like silicone spray and stuff to refresh the rubber. So now it, it doesn't creak. Um, it's got these sliding glass windows back here, which is nice. Um, what else? That's pretty much it, I guess. These, um, they look aftermarket, but they might be like a dealer sort of option because this is the same sort of brushed stainless steel as these little strips back here. It looks nice. Show the engine. So yeah, let me put these sunglasses off. So yeah, this is a Daihatsu DL50, four cylinder, turbo diesel engine. Um, being an 85, it's incredibly simple. Um, air filter your turbo exhaust is over here as well uh again it's not intercooled got a big ass battery which is about the size of the block the block's a little bigger but not by much power steering brake booster uh the windshield washer fluid so this is the tank for the windshield this is the tank for the headlights they're separate even though they operate on the same switch you have a different pump radiator overflow tank and then you have the air conditioner compressor down there, I believe. I'm not a super pro when it comes to this sort of stuff. Alternator, power steering pump is over here. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And again, you just the shape that this is in, um, in doing the research for this after I bought it, because of course I just bought it. I was like, oh, that looks neat. And then now I'm learning it as I get it. Uh, getting these rust free is really difficult in places like the UK. Um, in Japan, they don't use salt on the roads, and I believe this one was used more in like the south or somewhere warmer because the air conditioning system is working. And that's usually not something I see. Usually it is working, but it's been neglected and it just doesn't have any charge to it. This one, though, however, came fully working and fully charged, and uh, when I bought it, the oil had just been changed, the air filter had just been changed, and I haven't checked the fuel filter. Uh, I went ahead and changed the oil here anyway because the temperatures are much different than from what I experienced as opposed to what I imagine Japan would. But I didn't absolutely need to. Um, the tires were shot, of course, and these are BF Goodrich All-Terrain TAs. They're the KO2 one. Uh, these are, what the hell's the size? 235, 75, R15s. Um, these do fit. 
and the springs being aftermarket springs there is a little bit of a lift that it gave it probably like a half inch maybe so you do get more space there and i don't have any other problems except these at low speed because it's the only way you would turn that hard uh lock to lock they do rub the springs back here so if you do have something like this be aware that this is as big of a tire as you're going or at least as wide of a tire as you're going to want to get and you could do big goofy lift and stuff if you really wanted to but I like the stance that it has. So, uh, well, that's pretty much it. And it is my daily driver, so let's go daily drive it. All right, let's go drive. Um, I'm gonna start this and then. Give you an idea of what it sounds like idling. It's pretty loud, but not obnoxious. It's like all engine noise. And it runs fantastic. slipping my foot. Whoops. And like I was saying earlier, uh, in the United States, because we didn't get, especially small like diesels, there's like a like an innate desire that a lot of people have about them. So because this has those decals on the side that say turbo diesel, and then of course you listen to it, uh, this gets a lot of attention and it's, well, it's badass looking too. So it's like a, kind of like a really small Bronco or something. But yeah, this gets a lot of attention and a lot of people ask me about it. And like if I'm selling it, well, you know how people like that are. They don't probably actually want to buy it. They're just curious. Uh, and I got this for a really good deal. And I think it's kind of more the exception because of how nice it actually is. Uh, as far as driving, it's pretty pleasant. Uh, it's bouncy. And uh, because I put those tires on it, I'm still trying to figure out what the best air pressure is and I still think it's a little high because it's a little too bouncy compared to the old tires pressure on the door says 24 psi and I think they're at about 30 right now and it's still just a little too much I don't know what the top speed is uh, but you can't take this on the highway it's really most comfortable at going about 65 it's probably the top speed that I would actually like want it to go. Otherwise, it just it feels more strained when you're getting the revs up really high. I haven't taken it off road yet because it wasn't in the shape for that. Uh, now that I've got the suspension done, I want to go through and uh, change the differential fluid and all that stuff because I don't know when the last time it was done. I mean, I have the maintenance things but it wasn't being driven for a little bit before I got it. And like I said earlier, one owner car, which is kind of nice. So if that person is still around, I hope they would appreciate that it ended up going to the United States and basically retiring in Florida. Cause I really like this. And although I'm pretty um, quick to change my mind, I'll get something I'd be like, oh, I'm absolutely keeping, keeping this forever. And then, a month later, I'm like, oh, never mind, I'm done. Like I did with my uh, Honda Activans. However, I really like this. And this is my first diesel, anything. Uh, I really like that it's five speed. I like the way it drives. I like the way it sounds, and I like 
the amount of torque it has. It's a very, it's been described, in general, like a high torque has been described as like the hand of God pushing you. And that's what this feels like. It feels like a, like it'll just push or pull whatever you want it to and it won't, won't break a sweat. It pulls slightly to the right. I haven't had a uh, alignment done, especially since I changed the geometry, the suspension and everything with putting larger tires on it than it came with. So that's something I have yet to do. Um, I do want to get it repainted. But then again, maybe I don't. There really isn't much else it needs. Or that needs to be said besides I really like it. people that were too old just well not like I have a new complaint or a new way to describe them I haven't pulled anything with this either although it's certainly capable of it I have to get a uh, trailer hitch back Still have yet to do the rotors. Excuse me, man. Yeah. Who's that made by? Daihatsu. You remember the Rocky? What? Yeah, it was kind of like a tracker or a samurai. Yeah. Yeah, this is the Japanese market turbo diesel long wheelbase version of that. Wow, four cylinder? Yeah, four cylinder turbo diesel. Not intercooled, but. Oh, pretty cool, nice brake. Yeah. Thanks. And, uh, like I was saying, that, that happens a lot. And, uh, I made a point to keep the wheels, and they were originally white, but refinishing them and painting them, uh, as opposed to putting some big fuck-off super wheels on it. I think it does wonders for the aesthetic that it has. Everybody puts big black, this is like those Lone Star wheels everybody slaps on the Jeep. You know how much more original keeping the wheels stock? How much nicer that looks. And this does have uh, aftermarket horns on it too. I don't know what the original horn was, but it sounds kind of weak on this anyway. I won't honk it now because I'm in traffic, but. It's a very Japanese horn. Kind of polite. And I know this is slow, but it doesn't feel slow. So, I, I don't know. It's certainly not fast. But there's no issue with it keeping up with traffic or maneuvering or anything. Besides people constantly asking you about it. shift. 
um, and it's it has a very distinct way that it feels when it's cold versus when it's warm so now that we're getting up the temperature it's a little smoother a little nicer and a bit more cooperative normally you have to do kind of like a weird little wiggle thing just to do it smooth and that might be something that I do with it too see how bad traffic is on Lido so we're in peak snowbird season I think it's about 80 degrees Fahrenheit here. But even when it was uh, like 90, 95 when I first got this, so it was fine. Temperature never goes past center line. And I said earlier, I'm pretty surprised at how good at fuel, how good of fuel economy it gets considering how I drive it and what kind of vehicle it is. It's like <laughs> completely non aerodynamic diesel powered brick. it's not very friendly when it comes to pollutants but hard to beat the fuel economy and if you look down here I don't know how this is gonna show up on the GoPro but when the turbo kicks on that light turns green Especially here in the United States. 
in the US where we never got anything like this. So it stands out. Feels good to drive. Feels honest. Stylistically, it looks fantastic. I mean there's some sort of feel some sort of aura about it that people want to have or experience or be seen as being like this is very much in that sort of vein to a lot of people this will be loud uncomfortable hard to drive but for me hey I think this is great And if you're a little bit vain like me, you certainly enjoy the attention. Gas pedal spring has a squeak in it too.
as well call it been at buying any of the ones that ever come up for auction and they don't um, there's more Toyota blizzards which are going to be the same thing just with a less sized engine I don't know I haven't heard anything bad about the blizzards just in context of the rugger existing people like the rugger more because of the engine 2.8 versus 2.4 liter I don't know the torque specs or any of that sort of stuff they are identical though. The Toyota Blizzard is made by Daihatsu just to put with the Toyota engine. So anybody that tells you that Toyota somehow built the Blizzard, they didn't. It was completely Daihatsu. Toyota built the engine is all. Uh, she had the gearbox, all the running gear, all that sort of stuff. Which is fine because Toyota fully owns Daihatsu now. Back in the 80s, they were just really, they worked really closely together. Nowadays, Daihatsu is Toyota. They've always kind of been. Whoa! Almost turned to reverse there, did you hear that?
get your parts overseas. A lot of the interior parts and things you can get from the Blizzard, being it's a Toyota, it seems to be much more supported OEM wise. So if like you want original parts, Blizzard parts are easier to get than Daihatsu parts. Even though they're gonna be the same in almost everything. Except engine. Um, otherwise, the United Kingdom and Indonesia are gonna be your largest places to get aftermarket parts. 